All right, welcome everybody. Today we're cracking the code of eight James Bond movies with our special panel of four members of our Facebook group, the worldwide community of spy movie fans. If you want to join our group, check out facebook.com slash spy movie navigator. Hi, this is Dan Silvestri. And Tom Pizzotto. And Vicky Hodges. Of spymovienavigator.com and our podcast show, Cracking the Code of Spy Movies. So let's get cracking. We have our panelists assembled. Let's have each of them give us a 30 second intro to themselves, starting with Scott. Hey everyone, Scott Winteroth here, and uh, I'm in Chicago, Illinois, and just a longtime Bond fan and <clears throat> watched every movie. Of course, I have some that are favorites and others, but I'm going to share with those two with you guys today. So that's me. And then David. Hi, David Lippiet here in literally sunny Scotland. Um, <laughs> been a fan since I saw Live and Let Die in the cinema in 73, and uh, looking forward to hearing what everyone has to say. All right, Lindsay. Good afternoon, Lindsay Cancino from Nassau, Bahamas. Uh, been a Bond nut since I was about five years old, to be honest. So 1967. Super. Brian. Good morning from the Emerald City, Seattle. Been a Bond fan for about 24 years. Saw Tomorrow Never Dies when I was a kid. I'm excited to be here and talk some James Bond with everybody today. Super. Thank you very much, everybody, for being here. This is going to be fun. Okay, the deal is that each of our panelists had to select their favorite two Bond films, but each had to have a different actor playing Bond. <laughs> so let's start with Scott and the first movie, The Spy Who Loved Me, his first choice. Okay, well, first of all, it's incredibly honored to be here with all of you other spy James Bond fans. But second of all, it's hard to go first, so bear with me, guys. But uh, I had to go between uh, Roger Moore and Pierce Brosnan. Those are my two favorites. So I, my first pick was uh, obviously the older film, so The Spy Who Loved Me with uh, uh, Roger Moore. God, I just love this film. I think this is one of the, uh, this is iconic classic Bond, in my opinion. Um, I love uh, Connery's great. Lazenby was good. You know, Dalton's awesome, but to me, Roger Moore is all about Bond. And to me, he also reminds me a little bit of my father, so a little bit of that kind of thing. Okay. But, but at the end of the day, uh, this film was awesome. You've got Stromberg and his Marine castle, and Bond's trying to foil his plot to take over the world and build this underwater, you know, universe. I still feel today that this plot is still, like, over the top enough that it could still kind of play out today. Obviously, technologies have changed and stuff like that. So I still feel it's a little real. But one of my favorite parts of this film is obviously the uh, collaboration, if you will, with Agent Triple X, you know, uh, <laughs> the Russian counter agent, uh, lovingly played by Barbara Brock, who uh, I think yes. that, you know, when they're going through Cairo and they're looking for Fakesh, you know, like it's like I love that kind of bond, uh, pitter patter back and forth between the two of them. Uh, the collaboration between the Russians, KGB, which General Gorgoff is a, a great, you know, kind of like he's in several of the films, but it's kind of a. Uh, a fun way to see him interact and and the other thing i like about this film is it's very british you know he's not doing an american mission like in in the living daylights i believe like you know he's not going rogue like in die another day like or <laughs> Many movies. yeah die another, you know, he's he's on uh, uh you know he even though it's a uh, over the top you know over the top kind of plot where it's like let's let's you know take over the world trying to do this underwater thing it's still very much a british uh, secret service mission which I think is kind of like I like that one he, he stays kind of within his for queen and country kind of thing some of my favorite parts uh, Jaws is our, Jaws is you know Richard mm -hmm. Keel's in this film and I think he actually I think out of all the films that Richard Keel and Jaws is in that this is one of the ones that he's the most succinct in and of course, I love like, I like you know I like the octopusy a lot too uh -huh. and stuff like that. So there's there's not like if I guess if I had to pick one of the of the Roger Moore films, it would definitely be the Spy Who Loved Me. I know Roger Moore also said that that was his favorite film out of all the ones that he did. So I kind of over the years, I I use if you asked me a couple of years ago, I probably would have said Octopussy was my favorite. I know it's one of the weirdest ones, but ultimately. <laughs> I like. I ended up moving more towards the spy who loved me as I got a little older and a little bit more mature with my uh, Bond film viewings, if you will. But the so back to Richard Keel and Jaws. I think this one is where he's the most succinct into it. He's you know they use the the magnetic the magnetic <laughs> crane and towards the end to catch, capture him and then he chews the shark up. I think that's kind of well written into the script and yeah, and they yeah. then they happen to the escape pod and he swims to shore, which I think is kind of funny to to keep that going and yeah. and uh my favorite one of my favorite scenes is probably 
there's a million of them. I love when they're at the the pyramids. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, they're in there like the pyramids of Giza, and it, and you know, of course, Richard Keel and and Roger Moore running around, and that's when he first meets the jaws of life, if you will. But I think one of my favorite scenes is, um, and this might be a little weird, but is when Barbara Bach and or Agent Triple X and James Bond are on the train, and uh, there's the fight scene with with Jaws, and he pushes them out the window, which. That happens a couple times in the D- James Bond series where James Bond pushes someone out of a train window. I can't remember the other film I just watched, but I was like, oh, that happened once before. T. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Live and let die. Yeah, yeah live out. and let die. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's right. I just watched that one. So that makes sense. But right. basically, yeah. So that the train scene, I like, you know, it's like a little bit, that's when they kind of go from being just the spy. It's when she turns into the spy who loved me, right? Yeah. Kind of yeah. thing. <laughs> Another oh, scene. So I've got a question for you then. Yeah, so yeah. Go ahead. Richard Keel thrown and somebody getting thrown off a train. Did you see the movie Silver Streak? I, he he plays a henchman in that, and <laughs> he throws Gene Wilder off the train. So, <laughs> yeah, that's great. One, one of the many times time. that yeah, Wilder gets kicked off the train. I don't know. I don't know. If I've seen it, but if I did, I completely forgot about that. So yeah, yeah. thanks for bringing he, that he up. Was so a, anyways, he, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, he was a uh, he was great, and they brought him back, of course, for Moonraker because Jaws was mm-hmm. so popular in The Spy Who Loved Me. And Cubby Broccoli got so many letters from kids wanting Jaws to turn out to be a nice guy. <laughs> and so they wrote that into Moonraker at the end. Of course, he helps Bond yeah. to escape, right? And yeah. I know I'm Lotus running out of time, but I got, got like it. two more things. I have to mention the Lotus Esprit. The, the, obviously, that's one of the coolest yeah. scenes. I know that's that your background. Keeps, yeah, that, that's why it. I use it. I think it's like if I know it keeps going up for auction or was up for auction. I would love to be the owner of that. I don't know where I put it, but that to me would be, and I'd love to be stuck with Barbara Bach in the, in the Lotus East three underwater. I think that'd be fun. And uh, yeah, when they Springo. drive it up to this, you know, and I don't care how old you are when they drive the car out of the water and the kids are like, I think that's one of the coolest scenes. Yeah. Tom and I were at that uh, beach. Yeah. Where they yeah, drove it out of the water in Sardinia. Yeah. That's actually, that's actually very close to the hotel where they first meet Naomi. Yep. Oh, really? Is, yeah. yeah. Makes yeah, sense. Yeah. College and then finally, I got one more thing. I promise I'm done. One more thing in that movie. The It's got the 70s retro Bond theme song, which I think is kind of cool, where it's got a little, doo, doo, you know, like it's kind of a cool. I like to listen to it just by itself. So, so yeah. Oh, uh, cool. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Scott. Yeah, yeah that thanks. was great. That was great. All right. So Scott did The Spy Who Loved Me. Now we're going to go to David, and he's going to talk to us about his first choice from Russia with Love. Absolutely, and thank you very much. Um, for me, this is the quintessential Bond ethos. It's it's proper Cold War, 60s mm. espionage. It's I know Spectre's kind of managing things, but it's still kind of East-West. It's, it's still very much that old-school feeling that you get also in things like Ipcris File, mm-hmm. uh, Funeral in Berlin, that sort Love of it. thing. Love those two. Um, unlike some of the other ones, it's, it's very, very small scale. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, the big thing is is the lecture. That's it. There's yes. no plans yeah. to take over the world. It's just a little intricate plot. A bit of it's a, a follow up from Doctor No. You get a slight reference from um, the, the chess yeah. player oh. talking about revenge for for Doctor yeah. No, um, which is nice. So it gives you a little bit of continuity. It's quite claustrophobic. It's a bit <laughs> North by Northwest is one that's always compared with with From Russia with Love. Okay. And obviously the film came out after North by Northwest, but the mm-hmm. From Russia with Love novel came out two years before North by Northwest. So there are connections all the way through. You have the, the train sequence, you have the romance, you have the bit of adventure with the plane, with the helicopter, what have you. Yeah. Just to open it out. You've got the elegance of the, the suits and the, you know, <laughs> you, when you started watching this sort of film on TV, when you were, you know, in the mid 70s, you think, why are they wearing hats? <laughs> yeah. They don't wear hats then. But then you look back and you think, got hats, it's really quite cool, it's quite smart. I, I like to bring back the hats. <laughs> yeah, it's just one of these things. It's a very much, a, it's a different era. It's a different time. It's, it's um, it, yeah, it's it's definitely one of my favorites. And the fact that the helicopter chase was filmed about two and a half hours from my house is great. Yeah, wow. Yeah, I was going to say it's that not probably helps. Yeah. I, I, I personally think you could live without the boat chase. I think ah, okay. Wow, that was a big one. There for a bit of boom bang, but I think you can live without it. I think you can go straight to the the kind of Rosa Club denouement. Because mm-hmm. they moved um, the boat the, the boat chase from uh, well, they were in Istanbul, and the weather right. was bad, I guess. And they said, "Oh, yeah. we'll do this in Scotland." And so they they filmed it in Scotland. You've been there, right? You've been to those 
spots in that's Scotland. That's right. Yes, I had a very, very wet day about two or three years ago. Nice. Um, going up the hill, and you can still find the rock, and you can find the, the track for the where the, the 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 cars coming along when it's getting bombed by the chopper. Oh, nice. um, you can also find the the jetty where they they take off in the boats. Yes. And all the backdrop to the boat chase is is literally is right in front of you. So it's all in quite a small location, uh, and it does look fantastic. Yeah. And I remember seeing this probably end of the 70s in a double bill with Diamonds Are Forever. Um, yes. And the, 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 the claustrophobia of the train sequences. <laughs> and then suddenly it opens out with helicopters and, and mountains and, and everything. And it's, it's an incredible thing to watch on the, on the big screen if you ever get a chance. Yes. Um, and like I say, to me, it's, it's, it's quintessential Bond. It's, it's 60s, it's proper espionage. And that's why I absolutely love it to bits. David, this is my uh, top two <laughs> film on rankings. I absolutely mm -hmm. love this film. And it's got one of the best gadgets in the Atachi case, and I wish I owned it. <laughs> <laughs> and also my favourite, uh, Ali, uh, Ali in uh, Kerim Bay. Mm -hmm. I think he's one of the, the best allies that Bond had throughout the franchise. Yeah, Karen he is fabulous, and he's yeah. someone that, that I keep coming back to time and again. I look for that sort of Kerim Bay character in, mm. in the other movies. He was absolutely I think my favourite line is when he's having coffee with Kerim, and he asks him, what kind of coffee do you want? And he says, medium sweet. Yes. <laughs> what that says to me is is you've got someone that, that understands the local culture. Yes. And he always knows what the best thing is to have yeah. wherever he goes in the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he respects the local culture by trying, you know, the local delicacies, whether it's food and drink. And it's just this ability to move with ease. Yes. Wherever you are in the world. Yes. And, and he was... and just know what's what and what's where. And that is just such a when you're a little kid learning all this stuff, that really impresses you and it stays with you. Yeah, yeah, and he's perfect in the movie for that. Yeah, he is suave, yeah. debonair, worldly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. great guy. Yeah, definitely. Wow. Well, you also have to you also have to hit, love a movie that's got a, a fight in the middle of a camp with two women yeah. fighting over over oh, a guy. gypsy you, fight. You gotta oh. love a movie that does that. <laughs> <laughs> that was terrific. Yeah. That was awesome. I love that yeah, movie too. It's certainly movie. in our top five. <laughs> certainly in our top five. That's uh, one of the best Bond movies ever made. And it's still great. And I love that it's not this big worldly thing. I'm going to take over the world kind of stuff. It's about this lecture machine and getting, oh, this is great. This is good stuff. Mm -hmm. Real spy stuff. Real Cold War stuff. Good stuff. Well, it also it also had, you know, an Ian Fleming feel to it. So, you know, some of those oh, yeah. don't, where this one really does feel like, yeah, this is a Fleming novel mm -hmm. that we're mm -hmm. watching on, on the screen, which, mm -hmm. I, which I really appreciated. Great. Any favorite moments in that uh, film, David? I... I do actually like the start of the helicopter chase when you're not quite sure what's happening. Yeah. All the stuff on the train about having dinner and, you know, the, the red wine with fish and all that yeah, sort of yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. It's just so subtle and it's just, yeah. it's just there. Um, that's the sort of stuff that appeals to me. They kind of bond lifestyle rather than, say, the explosions. Yes. Mm -hmm. So it's the little bits and pieces. I've been lucky enough to go to Istanbul and go to the the, oh, wow. the station. had uh, had lunch at, at security officer Ben's table, uh, which was fabulous. Yeah, and had a trip wow. up and down the Bosphorus on the boat. I was going to ask if you did that. Tried yeah. to get my wife to step step a little bit further back to get the, the picture, <laughs> uh, which was great. So, so you know, these locations are all still there, and, and the stations um, had a lot of work done to it, but it's still very very. Rare. And it is uh, it is one of the places to go. Uh, so yeah, cool, very cool. All right, hey, let's move on. We're going to go to Lindsay now. He's going to talk about another great Bond movie, Goldfinger. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you, Dan. Um, and why do I love it? Well, you know, I, I agree with David um, as far as espionage goes. Uh, from Russia with Love is it. And uh, as I've gotten older, I've, I've come to appreciate it more. But the first sort of superstar Bond movie was Goldfinger. Mm. And I think it was Sean's, you know, the apex of, of portraying the role because I think he was extremely comfortable in it. Yes. Um, he coasted in Thunderball and you could see he was pretty much <laughs> bored by the time he got to You Only Live Twice. Yeah. But in Goldfinger, he was, I mean, on. And uh, when you're five years old, and your father says, uh, we're going to, to see these movies. And by the way, it was a double bill at a drive-in that I, that I saw it in. 
And the first movie was from Rush Would Love. But at five, I just sort of <laughs> ho hum, you know. And then on comes Goldfinger. And I was completely blown away right from the beginning. The the pre-title sequence with the with the uh, seagull coming up out of the water. <laughs> he goes and, and does his bit with the plastic explosives. Then he takes off the wetsuit and he's got on his, his uh, dinner jacket. And that he is looks such a classic. hundred million dollars, you know, I mean, yeah. just incredible. Yeah. And uh, so many firsts in the movie for me that, that sort of set a tone for the series as it went along. It's interesting Scott should bring up in, in his discussion of Spy Who Love Me, very much followed the the framework of Goldfinger in the construction of the movie because they had, uh, as we all know, there were there was a waning interest after the man with the golden gun. How do you bring this back alive? So they decided to go over the top, and you know where we ended up. <laughs> but um, the uh, the first time we get an instruction scene with Q, um, which is also you know iconic now. And the discussion over the the DB5, the incredible gadget. I, I get what you said about uh, the Atashi case. I love it as well. <laughs> but that car is something else. I have been in love with cars since that day, as a result of that <laughs> that, that explosion. Go. It was the first uh, fem equal female, if you like, um, in a in a Bond movie mm -hmm. in in uh, Pussy Galore. She was and. The, the first sort of mega villain. I agree. I don't, I'm not crazy when it goes way over the top, but uh, Goldfinger wasn't trying to take over the world. He was just trying to make his gold worth yeah. more. Yeah. yeah. But uh, Gert Frober just did an incredible job. I, I still think he, he is probably the best villain with the possible exception, Javier Bardem, but I'll come to that later. <laughs> but also the, with the one liners. I mean, this is where the one liners just went through the roof, mm -hmm. you know? When he, get, when he gets to the fountain blue and Felix comes to meet him and uh, it's time for man talk. You know, that, <laughs> I, think. I mean, Sean would have gone to jail if he'd done that today. Yeah. But uh, that, that wouldn't go over well here, at least in the US. No, it is just this little think, but um, yeah. it was an incredible scene. And then the banter between him and Jill Masterson also in, mm -hmm. absolutely top notch. The title song. You know, it's yeah. the first sort of major probably Bond song. Yeah. The and most known the song. song. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Probably one of the most known. Yeah. Uh, the title sequence. I know um, <laughs> Maurice Binder did From Rush With Love, I think, didn't do, or did he do Dr. No? Might have done Dr. No as well, but he was not there for Goldfinger. Robert Brown John did right. the title sequence there and took it to another level. I think that's what made Maurice Binder so much. Uh, more determined yes. <laughs> when he came back to Thunderbird. He had a little competition. It up. <laughs> exactly. To me, it's just quintessential super star mm -hmm. spy, you know? Yeah. Um, and I, I just love it. Uh, the clothes are even uh, a notch above. The suits he wears and... and oh, the three-piece gray. Yeah. 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 Like, in, in yeah. Suit when, he's, <laughs> when he's talking at the stud farm yeah. with Goldfinger about the yeah. plan and he discovers yeah. like, oh, wait a minute. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, even, even when it came down to getting my, my Funko pop mannequin. <laughs> yeah. cool. You, yeah. you got one. one of those, huh? <laughs> That's the one from Goldfinger. So, yeah. uh, you know, it's just an incredible um, introduction to me and it, I've been in absolute awe ever since. Mm -hmm. um, so Lindsay, I'm totally with you there. This is my number one film. Favorite yeah. villain, favorite henchman, favorite car, yeah. favorite one of the theme, theme <laughs> song possibly. The How could I forget our job? My God. <laughs> yeah, um, that job. was the other thing that that I think um, was so iconic. You know, uh, Jaws wouldn't be wouldn't even be in the movie if it wasn't for our job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 that's true. So, um, I've yeah. got to say, one of my favorite scenes is the scene with uh, Mr. Midnight and Mr. Solo in like this yes. sort of the Goldfinger man cave, if you want to. Yeah. And yeah. I just like all the the fact that he's got all these gadgets as well. Yeah, I, I just love that scene. <laughs> that, you're right, and it's also that was the sort of the first real exposure. I know he had a great um, set in Doctor No as well, but Ken Adam, you know, <laughs> got to go over the top in, in Goldfinger's playroom. You know, it just incredible. One of the best ever. <laughs> yeah, and and that's this is another one of those movies. It's got something that I I grew up caddying. So you've got a golf scene with a caddy. Yes. 
I'm hooked. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Golf it's the same the handicap. Thing to find, and it's just, it just works so well. Yeah. Well, and yeah. it's interesting because it's different in the book a little bit. So in the yes. book, the caddy is the one who, mm-hmm. who, who uh, steals, if you will, the golf ball, where mm-hmm. in the movie it's, it's Bond. And also in the book, you've got all eighteen holes to get through, yeah. so it, it, it drives yeah. a little bit. Yeah, 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 yeah. But but as as a former caddy, I just let the caddy do the stealing. <laughs> yeah. The books are fabulous, though. And Tom and I, we had an opportunity at Indiana University to study in person eleven of the original uh, Fleming manuscripts, paging mm. through his typewritten uh, his typewritten pages that he typed in Jamaica and then scratched out in pen and and wrote paragraphs, whole paragraphs in his own hand. It's like oh my god, and we're touching these pages. It was terrific. Mm, anyway, fabulous. a little aside. <laughs> but that's the books an, that's are another fun trip. But the the Goldfinger one was really good to look through there. Too. Oh, yeah. Goldfinger! So, yeah, yeah. That was also, my, one of my favorite little bits in Goldfinger is is on the, in the plane when he's getting changed <laughs> into his suit, and the, yeah. they mentioned that there was an attaché case, but it was damaged. Right. And that's a reference back. I always think to the attaché case in From Russia with Love, and it's so yeah. subtle. Yes. Yes. It's right. Just, it's just so it's just in there and yeah you glad you pointed is, that fine, out but if you know what it is it's great i think it most damaged, people would so miss sorry <laughs> yeah that yeah. was great yeah yep. terrific stuff yeah i was just gonna add that you know in a movie that's overflowing with great lines but my favorite line in any bond movie ever actually <laughs> the winner of the line is not bond it's is goldfinger and it's do you expect me to talk, Goldfinger? <laughs> yeah. No, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die. I love it too. <laughs> One of my favorites too, Lindsay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the thing I don't know is because they dubbed Goldfinger's yeah. voice. Yeah. Mm-hmm. How much of that was like play this line up so that the person who's dubbing it or did well, Gert d- over the top the, the delivery of that, which made the person dubbing it? Um, yeah, it's it's good. Uh, it's an interesting thing because I don't know if you've heard it. I've heard Gert Frober's original yes. track. Yeah. And there isn't an awful lot of difference, frankly. Yeah, um, yeah. Between the two. So I think the latter is true, Thomas, that the, okay. the guy who was dubbing it was like, well, why would I improve on perfection? So, <laughs> you know, he copied Gert Frober. Okay. Yeah. Even right. though Gert didn't speak a word of English when they hired him. Yeah. So. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Yeah, good stuff. All right, so we we talked about the uh, attaché case or attaché case with, the, of course, it had the AR seven rifle in there, which was mm-hmm. makes another appearance in a movie, and that is on Her Majesty's Secret Service, actually. So we're going to go to Brian, who selected that as his first Bond movie. Brian, alrighty, yeah. So with Her Majesty's Secret Service, it's kind of like this transitional film in the series. We had gone through the sixties where we had Sean Connery, who really exploded onto the scene as you know the 007 to watch and coming out in you know 1969 um you know george lazenby you know coming onto the scene with his new movie actually it was his very first film he ever did which is really interesting um they took this you know novice actor and really turned him into this international superstar and some things that i really think make this film great are uh, you know it was the last bond of the 1960s so you still had that kind of like trend setting where you know it was still this big, huge spectacle, and you knew exactly what you wanted to expect from a Bond film. And I think it really went out on a super solid note. So growing up, you know, it was always kind of like a battle for me. It was like, do I like Sean or do I like Roger? And it was back and forth. But, you know, I feel like the older I get, the more I can really, really enjoy this movie. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So basically, yeah, Bond, he's hot on the trail of Blofeld. He's trying to find Spectre after the events of You Only Live Twice. Mm-hmm. And it's it's kind of interesting because if you grew up reading the books, there's a huge difference because in the original series of novels, Majesty's Secret Service is the next film in the Blofeld trilogy mm-hmm. versus when you get to the films, now it follows what would have been the, the last novel in that trilogy. So it kind of led some confusion, but I think yes. that the way Peter Hunt directed that film really helped it out. I oh, think, yeah. yeah, going into it being like a prior editor and then going straight into the director's seat, you know, you could kind of go through and direct the film the way you want. And then if there's certain cuts you want or certain shots you want, I think his influence really helped make that stand out. And the parts- I, I, I always thought that um, it was unfortunate that Peter never got a chance to do another one because I yes. thought he did a fabulous job. Yeah, like, that was a terrific movie. Absolutely. He did. A, yeah, he did. And I think you're right. His editing experience really honed his, I'm going to take this shot and this shot and this shot. He was terrific. That was a great, great job. 
you're right. Yeah, I think you're right. He did a, an absolutely fantastic job. And I think it's always a, a strange irony that for someone that is a great editor and does really fast action, you end up with one of the longest films. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Good <laughs> but point. it's a superb job. <laughs> yes. But I love every minute of it. It's one of my oh, favorites, yeah. too. Yep. Yeah, one of, my top, yeah one of my top two or three. That's fine. So something I've always kind of wondered about that is, um, I know they've often said that, you know, with Majesty's Secret Service, how the kind of finale goes with Bond and um, uh, Tracy kind of Tracy. riding off. I know that they are talking about bump that to the opening teaser for Diamonds Are Forever. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if by including that back in the film, I wonder if that's what caused it to run so long. You know, maybe it would have only been, you know, two hours long, but then by adding that in, it adds so many extra minutes because they had kind of closed out the end of that story. Mm. Kind of going back to Peter Hunt's editing, you know, the thing that just strikes me as like the most profound evidence of this, if you watch the way that Lazenby throws a punch, it's almost spot on. You think, wow, <laughs> man, this guy, this guy knows how to knock people out. Yeah. And if, well, if he, actually like the, he actually did, he actually did. I was going to say. On his screen yeah, test. Yeah, for his screen test, right? <laughs> Tell him about that. That was good. <laughs> yeah. Um, the other thing too, the um, just the consistency with how it related to the plot of the novel, I always mm -hmm. felt that was just mm -hmm. masterfully done. Yeah. Um, I remember hearing that Peter Hunt used to walk around with the novel in his hand, and if something wasn't right, he's like, "No, no, 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 this is how they did it in the book. Yeah, you know, we got to follow." I mean, he was it was very close to the book. To it, mm -hmm. yeah. I also love that they had the return of the Aston Martin. I know it had been gone since Goldfinger, or no, I'm sorry, not Goldfinger, Thunderball. And they actually switched up the model. They didn't have the DB5 for this one. Mm -hmm. So him seeing, uh, you know, Bond cruise around a brand new one, especially in that first scene, it really kind of, you know, pushes Lazenby into that character role. And you really feel like, okay, this is a Bond movie. You know, it's got all the elements. And it kind of leads in that beach scene where, you know, he Ooh. and Terrence Mountain are tangling. And yes, yes. It's just a phenomenal opening. And then the thing where he kind of looks to the camera and he's like, this never happened to the other fellow. <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely love that one yeah. yeah i mean it's yeah. just total acknowledgement of okay we switch bonds yeah. deal with it right. yeah yeah Absolutely. i always think it works as well i've, I've got no problem with it I yeah it's, and, uh, great touch and, it and the other thing i think they, they paid a lot of attention to trying to um make you make sure you accepted him as the new bond so you had the flashback scenes um when he's about to resign etc yes. and so on but one of the, the key things i think that certainly grounded it for me was John Barry. The <laughs> score for On Her Majesty's Secret Service. One of the best ever. Perfect. Like, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Perfect. It's hard to beat. <laughs> yeah. But even like the beginning of the film, you know, when you have the gun barrel, you know, the music's completely different. I, you know, it kind of goes back to that yeah. documentary thing where they pause it right in the middle mm -hmm. and then they keep on. Right. And then um, just the way the soundtrack just kind of goes from there all the way into the film like you could listen to it from start to finish and just it, it's just so enthralling and you just never get bored with it uh the, the other thing that's interesting too kind of like we were talking about earlier how you know there's different elements of the previous bond movies that are kind of like callbacks in this film mm -hmm. i always thought the ironic part is you know this film is kind of like the one that gets called back to in the later films so much more mm -hmm. like in spy who loved me where he's talking to anya about you know tracy yes mm -hmm. um the visit and for your eyes only License to Kill when Della throws in the garter and you know Felix yep, goes. Yep, yep. He was married once, but that was a long time ago. Yeah, right. And it's just so interesting how impactful this film's been, um, and how like the kind of attitude of the world has kind of changed towards it. Yes, um, you know, going into nowadays, and I think that's what really makes it stand the test of time. Yeah, it's now one of the most popular Bond yeah. films, and yeah. you know, I wish George would have done more. <laughs> Absolutely, oh, I, I agree with you entirely. I think it'd been great if he'd done some more. Yeah, yeah. And was, the film just, I think, suffered because Great the change. previous ones had left the books behind, and they were getting gradually bigger and bigger and bigger. Yes. And suddenly, you stripped it back. Yeah. And they just didn't give the audience what they wanted, which was a shame because the film itself is just superb. And yeah. Well, yeah. And yeah. so so visually stunning. I mean, especially when yeah. you get up to Peace Gloria. I mean, just yeah. phenomenal. Yeah, there's so many great locations in that movie. It's just beautiful. The wedding scene. Tom and I went to virtually every uh, movie location in in Portugal and in and we were up in Pisgloria too. And the Portugal scenes, the the scene, the wedding reception scene in the mansion courtyard. Mm. Just we we got in there. It's private property, but we we were able to get in <laughs> and and film a few things there. That was terrific. But. It's just well done. Every shot in that movie is well done because of Peter Hunt and, and what went into the shots. Just beautiful. 
Beautiful movie. I love it. Uh, br- Brian, when you went over for the um, 50th anniversary yeah. celebration, did you do the Portugal part two or did you just do the, P- the Switzerland part? Yeah, unfortunately, I was unavailable for Portugal. I had some prior <laughs> commitments, but um, going over for the Switzerland part, um, it's it's interesting. It was kind of like a bucket list goal of mine. So, mm-hmm. I, you know, seeing that film, <laughs> um, you know, reading the book before and then watching it, you know, just the way it was like portrayed in that film, I'm like, I've got to go there. I've got to set foot on there. I don't care what I got to do. And it was just one of those things where like, all right, you know what? I'm just going to go over. I'll spend a night. I'll go up and fly back. But then I found out about the trip and I realized, whoa, there's so much more to this that I can really get involved in and I can meet a whole network of people. And just kind of going through there and just experiencing all, it was just you know, something out of this world. It's like nothing I've ever seen before. And um, you can really see why, you know, the scouting locate the people for the scouting location really were impacted by that place and why they're like, Hey, you've got to come here. We've got to shoot a film here. It was just spectacular. It's like something out of a dream almost. It is. It is. It's unreal. Brian, can I ha- ask you about the uh, Tracy's death scene and how you thought George portrayed it? I know a lot of people think that Sean wouldn't have dealt with that scene, the vulnerability that we get. What's your thoughts on that? So I, I would have to agree with that. Like, uh, you know, I, you know, growing up, I was always a very, very huge Sean Connery fan, you know, just watching his films, just the way he portrays his roles, the way his just, he can just flow from one character to another, doing all sorts of different things. And, you know, I remember growing up and people were talking about that final scene where Lazenby is kind of more somber. He's very, you know, a little bit more tearful, you know, just very, you know, just very sad and depressed by just the suddenness of everything that happened after everything we had seen in this two hour long film. And, you know, it's, it's a heartbreaking ending, probably the most heartbreaking ending of all the James Bond yeah, films. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That. Definitely. And I tend to agree. I, you know, it, I, I don't mean to, you know, talk bad about Sean, but you know, I don't think he could have pulled that scene off the way Lacey we did. And just the way it was performed, the way it had gone, you know, it, it really showed a different emotional side of Bond where you're yes. like, he's human, he's vulnerable, you know, he, because you get a sense as the film progresses that, you know, he really wants to leave the service, he wants to get married, yeah. go off, have a life of his own. And then, you know, this happens and it almost kind of like tugs at him being like, you know, he almost got out and then he's pulled back in yeah. suddenly. <laughs> Great, yeah. great line from Godfather 3. Yeah. I just when I yeah. thought I was out, yeah. they pulled me back in. The best line. I, I agree with you, Brian. I think I think yeah. Lazenby does a, an, an incredible job. Um, yeah. I mean, the question is, could you... anyone have done that better? Could that those lines have been delivered better? And I don't think I don't think uh, they could have been delivered better. Yeah. He, his well, face, his a, facial I'm expressions, a, his the, hugging her, everything about that is just perfect. It's just perfect. Yeah. So. I think it works for me because his performance is a bit less mannered than Sean's. Yeah. Sean mm-hmm. has Sean's style, mm-hmm. yeah. whereas George, to me, is is actually playing the character in the book probably for the first time, mm-hmm. and he he comes across as just like a regular guy in, in extreme situations. Yeah, yeah, a human because guy going through human when things. He's encased yeah. in the ice, and he's looking scared. Yeah, you know, he looks vulnerable. He looks human. Yeah, and I don't think you'd have got that so much from from Sean. He became. Certainly, as the films went on, he became just, well, what button do I press to get out of this situation, and what do I do here? And yeah. you know, so suddenly it became a much, a much more uh, human character. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think it, his, um, uh, the great sin that George committed was that he <laughs> had the temerity to follow Sean Connery. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> timing is everything. Really, the really the only thing that's wrong yeah. and i think that's what what resulted in the you know the less than stellar box office at the time but as we've all been commenting as time has gone on people have come to appreciate just how good that movie is how good yes. his performance yeah. was etc and um that's why I, I i say it over and over again i i think it's a great shame that he wasn't allowed to make another one yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, he... well, it's it's always hard to follow a legend. Yeah. Yeah. Because I mean, especially I think about it from a sports <clears throat> perspective, and you think about following a great quarterback or mm-hmm. being a coach replacing you know a legendary coach, how tough that is. You've got the same thing. There's getting the people's acceptance because it's it isn't Sean different. anymore. It's somebody else. Yeah. It's right. a different person there. That's a huge thing to overcome by bringing him in. It made it easier to do the transition to Roger because well, oh we've already seen another bond. Right. Yeah, it was. A I was going to say that that position. It, it, you're right. It did make it easier to transition to Roger. But the other uh, benefit was that Roger had been playing James Bond. It's just 
His name was Simon Tesla. Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> so yeah. much of his character came from the Saint. Yep. I've watched every right. Saint episode. Of course, Shirley Eaton was in a couple of the early Saint episodes yeah. as well, and yeah. and other Bond characters uh, were in there as well yeah. too. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to throw in one final note there. I think the other thing that really kind of helped Lazenby was just the star power of the film. I mean, they brought in Telly Savalas for Blofeld. Yes. They brought in Diana Rigg. Perfect. And I always loved the connection between the Avengers and James Bond. Yes. And so I think by bringing that in, it kind of eased him into the role and really helped him. Yes. Where Sean Connery could just like lead any picture he wanted. You could put anybody <laughs> with him and it just worked. Yeah. You know, Lazenby didn't really have the star power, but by bringing in you know, an Avengers star and Savalas and even looking at Savalas as potentially the greatest Blofeld ever, but that's a whole other discussion, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I like him. <laughs> really helped the whole flow of the film, the transition and everything. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. All right, now I think we're finished with round one. That was fun. So we're, <laughs> we're going to go back to Scott, and he's going to tell us about his second favorite movie, Tomorrow, Tomorrow Never, Never Dies. Never dies. Yeah. yeah. So your, back, your backdrop has changed. Uh, yes. <laughs> Tomorrow so, Never hey, Dies. Here I probably go. picked the two Bond films that have like the non-Aston Martin <laughs> vehicles in them, and also the two Bond <laughs> films that have uh, Bond partnering with a female ally, right? So I thought that was interesting. Okay. But Tomorrow Never Dies, I'm here representing Pierce Brosnan on this panel. I don't think I'm the only Pierce Brosnan person. And I think that, <laughs> so this film to me is iconic. Uh, it's it's maybe not the best Bond film. It's maybe not the most iconic. I mean, Golden GoldenEye is probably truthfully Pierce Brosnan's best Bond film. I would not disagree with that. And But this film does have some things that I don't think people think about. One. This does set a paradigm shift in the Bond series. This is actually probably the first modern technology, if you will. Mm -hmm. Cell phones are introduced in this film. You know, you've got this the the 750 IL, which I know is like the lamest Bond car, but I thought I love this car. <laughs> I used to drive around like parking garages in the city, like pretending I was Bond and driving around crazy. <laughs> I probably, I'm sure, don't I? I wouldn't admit that as an adult, but like you know, as a teenager. Also, I was like a, I was in my teenage years when this film came out, so this was. He, pl he played a very impressionable Bond for me. I used to work at an upscale department store and, and wear a black suit, and I would obviously walk around the store thinking I was Pierce Brosnan playing James Bond. So it was kind of a kind of a side note there. But ultimately, I like this film. Judy Dench makes her return in this film, and I think one thing that I was thought was really interesting as I watched this film the other day is that the opening scene where they're in the there's like a, a terrorist flea market, if you will, where they're buying and selling goods. And Bond doesn't speak for like almost the entire first eight minutes of the film, which I thought was interesting. It's all well, you Judy know he's Dench. Still there. You know he's there doing his stuff and you get a sense mm -hmm. of him. And it's one of the best pre-credits. You're right. It's fabulous. Yeah. And I, and I liked it. He's, he's flying the airplane. He shoots the other guy up. And, you know, I, it's one of the better pre-credit scenes, I think, even though he doesn't really speak or you don't even see Bond until about halfway into the pre credit scene. I think The the World Is Not Enough and Tomorrow Never Dies are two films that in some ways, I always get them confused a lot. <laughs> Actually, there's a lot of parallels yeah. to these films in my opinion. Uh -huh. I think Tomorrow Never Dies, I liked, you got the Carters, you got the the media mogul. It seems, again, it seems like a kind of a real a real plot, a real, like a, it seems realistic yeah. in terms of what, uh, taking over the world, this could actually possibly happen. The remote control cell phone adapter for the car, I think is one of the coolest gadgets ever. I, I mean, I wish I had that today. It doesn't even exist today. And ultimately uh, you've got really, when it cues uh, Desmond Llewellyn's final films, I know it's not his actual final film, but one of his mo his final films, which I think that they played a good homage to him in that. And one final thing with Tomorrow Never Dies is that this is actually the first Bond film scored by David Arnold which would kind of bring us into a new era of the more modern Bond music. I love to listen to the Bond soundtracks and I compare and contrast. Goldeneye, I forget who actually scored that movie, but it's definitely a much different. Eric Serra. Eric Serra. Yeah, Eric Serra, thank you. It was a much different score than you get from David Arnold and beyond. And I, I could be wrong in terms of the names there, I, I, but that's from my knowledge anyways. And mm -hmm. Tomorrow Never Dies, The World Not Enough, I think the theme songs from the world, I actually like the theme song of, the, the, the scoring of The World Is Not Enough better. But I, I think that was a great Pierce Brosnan film too. I just think that Christmas Jones kind of ruined that that <laughs> film a little bit. I thought it was a little too, a lot of people um, that, yeah. I'm get, I know I'm getting off my, my one <laughs> my one film here, but I thought it was a little too, I love that. I, I would actually pick The World Is Not Enough, but the Christmas Jones thing, as much as I love the, the person who played uh, that role, I can't think of Denise Richards, as much as I love Denise Richards, She's gorgeous in that oh, film, yeah. but it just kind of made it a little clunky, I think. But other than that, Dr. Jokes. 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> also, Christmas Jones. I mean, it's not yeah. like a pussy galore or something like that. It's kind of a weird, a weird name, I thought. But other than I think, that, I think it was all that name was there yeah. just for the final punchline. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It it felt that way a little (laughs) bit. I agree. But otherwise, I thought that was a great film, too. And I, these, those two, the two middle ones with Goldeneye, I think, are obviously some of Pierce Brosnan's, I think, best Bond films. Mm -hmm. And to me, they're some of the best because those are the ones that I grew up with and enjoyed watching. So that's what I have to say about that. Scott, I am with you all the way on this. (laughs) Uh, Pierce Brosnan got me collecting in 95 for, for Goldeneye, and it's just gone, hence the. Thing behind me. I have two questions for you regarding this. I think it's a very underrated film, and I think it's more relevant now with its fake news. And um, mm-hmm. but my two questions are: Anthony Hopkins was originally cast mm-hmm. as Elliot Carver, mm-hmm. and he backed out because of the course script issues. What would he have brought to the role that Jonathan Price? Which actually, I think Jonathan Price is great. I like him. I'll, I'll admit it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And secondly, Terry Hatcher, not a fan, I must admit. Monica Belushi was who Pierce Brosnan wanted to play that part. And, of course, the Eon went with Terry Hatcher. What are your thoughts on that? So we've got Anthony Hopkins for Carver, Monica Belushi as <laughs> Paris Carver. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. It's hard for me to see that because they didn't play. They ended up not playing the role, you know. So, and, and I like everything the way it is, kind of thing. So, I think Elliot Carter, uh, and I can't remember his actual name, uh, but um, I right. think he. Yeah, I think he was a he he. I don't know. He, he's not super villain, but I guess he does look more like a CEO of a of a media company. So that sort of fits in terms of Terry Hatcher. Instead, in terms of Terry Hatcher, I I think she looks beautiful in this movie. So whether or not she was supposed to play it or not, I thought she did a, a pretty good. I thought she did a good job. I also liked her from Superman, so kind of was a nice tie-in. And I wish she didn't die so quickly in the film. I know yeah. in the plot she kind of dies, sort of she's in, and then she's dead kind of thing. But also, you know, Michelle Yee playing the uh, Chinese agent, I think is kind of a nice, you know, I, I think that also had some type of word, but I don't remember. There was something with that too, where that was a first. I can't remember what, but either way, I thought that was a nice tie-in. It's also weird where... It's not a bond where he ends up in bed with the leading lady at the end. Also, I think it's there's one little quip in the film where he says brushing up on a little Danish when Money Penny calls him. <laughs> I think that's one of my favorite uh, favorite quotes it's, in the entire good film. Line. So, yeah. Right. So, yeah. Cool. so in, now, in, in in relation to your question there, Vicky, you know, it's got to be tough to have a choice between Anthony Hopkins and John Price. <laughs> yeah, I mean, two really good actors. Yeah. It's like, yeah. which one yeah. can we choose from? Yeah. Yeah. Boy, be, most casting yeah. directors would love that option. Do you not think Anthony Hopkins is at the stage where whatever he's playing, you're just sitting there going, it's Anthony Hopkins. Yeah. And you don't yeah. I mean, I even yeah. found that with Silence of the Lambs. I'm just sitting wow. there, it's Anthony Hopkins. He's just <laughs> at that level. He's kind of gone beyond yeah. the ability to inhabit a character. But that's, yeah. that might just be my opinion. But he he okay. devoured the the scenery in Silence of the Lambs. I mean, he just yeah. dominated the yeah. entire film, and he's only in it for a quarter of it. Yeah. But I, I agree, though. I, I think it would have been intriguing to see Tony Hawkins try to to handle that. That that would have been something else. Mm. Terry Hatcher was a um, a marketing decision. Fortunately, that's that's why she was popular in the United States. The United States is a big bond market. Yeah, that's why she was chosen over Monica. But yeah. I didn't think she did a bad job, actually. I thought it was, it was, no, it was I agree. Well yeah, no, I, I that, think it was good. That scene where um, uh, Bond is in the hotel and he's looking very moody with his drink, that is my favorite scene <laughs> of any Bond. I will slide off the settee. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. like, uh, I just love it. I must admit, it's very underrated. My, I do prefer The World is Not Enough because I think that's Brosnan's best performance as Bond. Mm. Although Goldeneye is my favorite Brosnan film, yeah. for nostalgic reasons more so than anything. Yeah, yeah. No. interesting. The actors seem to get into their stride in the third film. Yes, yeah. so we've yeah. talked about yeah. Spy, we've talked about yeah. Goldfinger, we've talked right, about right, World right. Not Enough, and it's always the third film where they kind of play yeah. around with the character for a couple, mm. and then you think this is the way we're going to go with with this actor. Really solid. Yeah, yeah. I well, did and, read- I, and I find that interesting because in a lot of TV series, in a lot of other movie series. The third film is usually not that good, right? Because mm. they've got the solid idea for one and two, yeah, and then they've got three, or at least one. And it's <laughs> and it's kind of interesting to see how mm. you know, yep. in the, in the Bond yep. world, it's kind of different. 
Yeah, I think oh, you're right, Scott, to pick up on the, the soundtrack, because I think David Arnold really lifted it. Yes. My own take is that GoldenEye was a misfire, but that's just me. Oh, wow. Uh, so I think they really like roared Golden. back with, with a passion in, in Tomorrow Never Dies, uh, especially the first half. I think the second half, when you get to lots of bullets spraying around everywhere and no one being hit, I yeah, can it, tune out a little bit. It's like into a 90s honest. action <laughs> flick, isn't it, the second half? A lot of people think it's a 90s action flick. Yeah, I think they, they, they um, lost the way a little bit of... with, with that scene, but certainly the first half up to the, the, the car getting reparked in the Avis rental office yeah. um, <laughs> is, is such a strong... Yeah, let's um, see. Return to, to proper bond. Right. I, I, I disagree with you, Scott. I like the um, the 750. Um, the fact that it was a, a sedan as opposed to a Swiss sports car yeah. actually makes it more likely as a as a as an agent than driving around <laughs> in an Aston Martin, as much as I love them. That's true, too. But it's also one of two bond cars that I've owned not, not having the wherewithal to own an Aston Martin. The first one was a Z3, which was from yeah. Golden. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The second one was that car behind you. So ah, nice. Yeah. I, st I still have a Z3. Yeah. So. He, he, Tommy has my yeah. old Z3. Yeah. I bought it from Dan 20 years ago or something. And... Uh, yeah. All right. I love the, I love the Z8 in the, the world's not enough, but this, this car yeah. does have a lot of cool gadgets on it. I get oh, it. Yeah, sure. And the plus remote. I mean, that. To me and i even had like i had that same exact cell phone the ericsson cell phone back in the it was like a prepaid mm -hmm. phone it yeah. wasn't exact but it was pretty close and i thought i thought i was james bond driving <laughs> around and, go. and going into parking garages and driving around it was, was it ericsson or thing. nokia because i remember seeing that no. when i was in europe it was ericsson yeah and yeah. when i first right. saw that and and i'm like well, what would you do with this and then <laughs> you'd see the movie and it's like oh that's what you do <laughs> you <know>. yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All it's right. such a nice touch with the, the license plate behind you, Scott, with the yes. nod back to Goldfinger. Yeah, mm. yeah. yeah, yeah. It's yeah. A, it, this is from the film. You can see him yeah. sitting there. I thought there, that so. was a nice touch in the film. Yeah, yeah, now the original license plate in Goldfinger, of course, that car came right from the Saint set. That was one of the prototype cars uh, for really? the DB5. I didn't know that. Yeah, it had the same plate. And there is a there is a, a, a one Saint um, show, one of the episodes where the bad guy is driving it and it's the exact same license plate that bond has they just changed the color it was some kind of burnt orange red or something like that in the saint of course it was black and white you couldn't tell and they they sprayed it i think it was cloud silver or something for for the bond movie anyway all right we're going to wrap up tomorrow never dies now and originally it was going to be called tomorrow never lies because he's writing yes. the headlines yeah. of tomorrow's newspapers all right all right, we're going to move to David now, and he's going to talk about the man with the golden gun. <laughs> okay, I, I I sense this might be a bit of a hard sell because it's usually pretty far down on some of the on some of the <laughs> the, yeah. the lists. Well, that's why but, it's beautiful. We can all have our favorites. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, the, the reason I, I I tend to revisit this a lot on DVD, and I'm sitting there late in the evening, and I'll, I'll put something in. It takes me back really to when I first saw it, 1974. I was eight. I'd been to the cinema the year before to see. Live and Let Die. From that, I remembered something about New York and a boat chase, and that was it. <laughs> now, this one, I'd drawn up with, with Roger Moore and TV, so the, the, the Saint and, and the Persuaders. Mm. So it was a nice kind of through line to think, oh, there's Roger again doing his stuff, nice jacket and tie, comfortable with this. I didn't know about the, the Bond ethos or anything about that because I hadn't seen the, uh, the Sean films. They didn't come on TV until about two, three years later, starting working my way through it. So this was... Something something different for an eight year old sitting there in a in a Glasgow winter watching watching this stuff with the, the the lighting and the scenery and all the rest of it, and of course I'd grown up on TV with as we've talked before the Saint the Champions, Mission Impossible, mm. It Takes a Thief, all these okay. things that were based on the original Bond, that then spread on television. So I was used to the idea of you know your your hero in a smart suit going off and doing something extravagant, and of course in these shows you had budgeting reasons you had a location shot which was a postcard shot of a city and then you cut to a, a set whereas this was the first film i think that i really got swept up in the the location so it opens up in this mysterious looking landscape you have no idea where you are or what's happening you've got the the, the music in the background which is just ever so off-putting you then got knickknack who appears and that's just such a weird concept when you're seeing this for the first time but the whole film is just it's such a subjective experience because there's the most amazing scene where the hitman appears and i know he's called rodney in the in the script 
to me, there's a line back through the same character in Diamonds Are Forever, almost to Solo and Goldfinger. Mm -hmm. And there's a scene where Nick Knack leads him up the stairs into Scaramanga's lair. And you're coming through a dark corridor and suddenly it opens up into his main living room with the view of the, the, the sea outside. And that notion of walking from the darkness into the light in the cinema when you're a kid was just the most amazing thing. Yeah. Um, things that you pick up on nowadays, like Black Velvet and Oysters and Tabasco and little bits of class like that, that you, you, know, you don't get that when you're a kid. The other big transition scene that really had an impact is when you cut to the Casino, Casino de Macau neon sign and that rich music playing and you really are there. And that just absolutely blew me away. I was mm. I was there as 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 an eight year old. You had a slightly more elegant way of introducing locations. I think in those days you didn't just have a a tourist video shot and the the title of telling you where you are. You know you had to kind of work out where you were, whether it was Macau or the hydrofoil in Hong Kong. So, okay, I'm, I'm in Hong Kong. You don't need a big sign saying you're in Hong Kong. <laughs> the other lighting, the, the, I keep coming back to the lighting because I think that the lighting in this film is unlike anything else I've ever seen even going into Miss Anders' hotel room with the champagne. There's something about, there's a, there's a veneer of, of the lighting in that room that, that seems to work quite well. The karate school, the karate stuff was mm. brand new. We hadn't had Kung Fu and TV. I certainly wasn't of age to go and see Bruce Lee films. This was brand new. It, again, it's something different. It's so mysterious, it's ex exotic. It's probably one of the most exotic Bond films, just in terms of differentness, mm. location. Mm -hmm. So you you have to love James Bond Island. That that's that's yeah. another yeah. one of those. I've got yeah, you gotta get there. You're, you're flying along and the music's playing and the planes hitting the trees yeah, and yeah, just going yeah. around and you're thinking, what is this place? I mean, where is it? You just didn't know. Yeah. I mean, nowadays you're just gonna look it up, but you're yeah. sitting there in '74 and you just have no idea where it is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a bit of fun having JW back. I mean, I know some people don't like it, but the appeal for this film for me is is watching it as an eight year old. And every time I watch it nowadays, I watched it yesterday. I still get that same buzz over one or two of the transitions and one or two of the scenes, even though objectively and academically you could probably rip it to shreds. <laughs> I still love it beyond beyond words. <laughs> cool. The car chase has still got some serious driving in it, whatever you say about it. Yes. And just the, 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 the location at the end on the island is just so out of this world. So there we go. It's, it's a time travel back to my childhood whenever <laughs> I see this one. And it works every single time. I think I'm going to have to watch that one again. I haven't watched it in a while, so I think you just resold me to go take a look. Yeah, there, there are go. a lot of good parts to it, and yeah. certainly the scenery yeah. is spectacular. Hey, David, David I, have... I, I, uh, I love the fun house. I, I think as a kid watching that, it was just wow. What is this? You know, yeah. with the the gangsters that are shooting mm -hmm. and the and the uh, the cowboy. I have a YouTube channel called The Bond Room Unlocked, and I've just done a, a piece on the man, uh, the man with the golden gun, and we look at the fun house, mm -hmm. and I break it down, and it's very similar. I'm going to sort of go off tangent slightly. Very similar to a ride in that's now closed called the Great Movie Ride. I don't know if anybody knows yes, this ride. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there are two, a it couple of down. scenes <laughs> in that which remind me of the fun house. Yes. In the man with the golden gun, yes. the gangsters and the cowboys. It just bought, when I went on it, it just brought all that back. And and this is the beauty about Bond. You get transported to somewhere else. And uh, I mm. think that's why we all, we, are, we all love the franchise. There's so many oh, other yes. things that it opens up. Oh, yes. Yeah. I mean, watching it yesterday, you, you start to think of small points, like why would a, a waxwork dummy have a loaded pistol? Yeah. And, <laughs> um, you know, wine bottles just don't break like that when yeah. you're trying to break a wine bottle. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, they're hard the to lunch break. The lunch scene with Scaramanga at the end, you want more of that. You want more of Scaramanga because he just comes across as the most amazing character. He could have his own film quite easily. Mm -hmm. Seriously. Yeah, Christopher Lee. Yeah, I think oh, he was brilliant. related to uh, Fleming, wasn't he? That's right. He yes. Yeah, cousin, cousin or second cousin or something. Yeah, yeah, something like and that. And you also got a sense with this one that they spend a lot more time in the locations. Yes. Whereas mm -hmm. something like Octopussy, you tend to get a couple of establishing shots and then you're into a set. Yes. Whereas this one, they do walk from street corner to street corner. They are there, and they're there for a long time. Yeah. Tom and I say uh, that in, in the Bond movies, when a door opens, the other side of the door is Pinewood. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, okay, that's true. All right. I, th I think part of that, though, too, is if you're going to if you're gonna pay to get all those people there, it's kind of like when they did on Her Majesty's Secret Service. You know, they paid to get all those people there. You might as well stay there and take advantage of what's there 
Yeah, yeah and License mm-hmm. to Kill, I think they had no, uh, virtually no shots at Pinewood. It was all, it was in yeah. Mexico and, and Florida. In the States, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I just want to jump in. Hey, David, I absolutely agree with your assessment of the film. Man with Golden Gun is one of the ones that, you know, when, when I'm just looking for a Bond movie just to watch, it just seems to be kind of like my go-to. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the points that you hit on were just spot on between like the lighting, the transitions, some of the music, some of the different cues and stuff like that. The biggest thing, and it's always been like, um, when I watch that film, I, I understand a lot of people from certain places, you know, they look at it as like, it's an inferior Bond film. But I feel like whenever I watch it, I always look at it as what they could have done with it. Mm-hmm. And um, it's always throwing this idea out there. You know, what if they let Maude Adams live and kind of gave her the main Bond girl? Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. I felt like that would have solidified the plot a little bit better, you know, given that she was the one that sent the bullet to England with his number and everything like that. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's a great idea that. because even as a kid, um, good night annoyed me. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think that's a fabulous idea because I, I think she's the, the more interesting of the two characters. Yeah. Yeah. And it's kind of something they touched on in, in some of the Daniel Craig films, you know, this this notion of the you know, the, the sort of mysterious female who, who plays a part of the role, you know, part in the plot. But, you know, she's got to go, so bang, she's gone. Yeah. <laughs> a difficult shot, yeah, but most yeah. satisfying. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's move on then. We'll go to Lindsay for Skyfall. <laughs> okay. My second choice, uh, and it is my my second favorite Bond movie after uh, Goldfinger. Uh, interesting because, uh, like a lot of people, and I, I hope I don't get shot for this, but um, I was not thrilled when I heard that Daniel got the role. Um, I thought Robert had lost a mind. He was too short. He was blonde. All sorts of things were wrong. And I, I, I wondered if we were going to see the end of the series. And he came in and just killed it. I mean, he just <laughs> killed it. Yeah. And the the reason that he killed it is that he went back to Fleming. And it, it's interesting, you know, I, I, I say that Goldfinger is my favorite and it's over the top. It's not Fleming-esque in that sense. But the one that grounds it for me is, you know, Daniel really makes you feel that James Bond is a real living person that has feelings, has been yeah. uh, hurt, has been, um, you know, traumatized you know he's an orphan the scenes in scotland with uh judy dench when they talk about him being an orphan and so on very few words but incredibly inf- effective and um you know bringing andrew Bon and monique delacroix which i assume very few people even know those names yes. but i know them because i've read the books yes, and yes. just those little touches to me uh, are, are so important and it's the first time really that we've dealt with his past um, mm-hmm. in any significant way. You know, there is, as, as Brian pointed out, that incredibly poignant scene when he loses Tracy in, uh, yes. on a Majesty's Secret Service. But beyond that, it's not until we get to, to Skyfall, really, that you really feel for the guy. And um, again, I think, as uh, we mentioned about third movies, I think uh, it's where Daniel really hits his stride. I think it's where they develop him as James Bond, as opposed to Casino Royale being the, that dreaded word, reboot, and, and him being an unfinished mm-hmm. diamond, if you like. And he, he then learns all the other things that we come to know as James Bond. But he's incredibly competent, suave in it. Uh, the clothes are, again, amazing in Skyfall. <laughs> that gray suit on the train chase was clearly, although it wasn't three piece, right. is is a, a hark back to um, the one from Kentucky and Goldeneye. Mm-hmm. But I mean, Golden, Golden, Golden Finger. Finger, so. Finger. So, you know, I think it, it, it did an awful lot of, uh, again, firsts, M dies, and we lose an uh, uh, interesting choice for M being the, uh, a woman. But Judy Dench, again, j- did such an amazing job taking in that role and, and making it her own. But it creates one of the most memorable scenes of tragedy in a Bond movie, again, at the end when she dies. And he actually cries this time. Uh, whereas going back to Brian's um, choice, Lazenby tried to, he wanted Bond to actually cry on screen. It was the producers and, and Hunt that said, no, you can't, James Bond doesn't cry, you idiot. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So that, that's why uh, you end up with the scene that you have. And she's a mother-like figure. She's not the usual 
girl that's been in bed with him. So I think so many things about it are unique. And I mentioned it earlier when I was talking about Goldfinger. Javier Bardem, just unbelievable uh, portrayal of a villain and taking it to a new place. <laughs> when they're in, on the grounds of, uh, of Skyfall and running across that uh, frozen lake and he, and he stops him and he says, all this running around, it's so exhausting. I just, I just about fell out of my chair. I, you know, brilliant acting, incredible characterization of the villain. So I think it, it, it really did a great job at making it a Bond movie. The, the DV5 reappears, etc. Mm. To great effect, and he just owns it at that point. We could talk about the missteps, Inspector, but we're not talking about that now. I just think it's it's his best performance as James Bond. And I think it's a really solid movie from start to finish. And it goes over new ground, which is what I like about it the most. Can I just intervene? I think pretty much we've we've all agreed so far, but this will be the one that I might not agree. I'm not a fan. I prefer <laughs> Casino Royale, personally. Yeah. Yeah, um, mm-hmm. yeah, to Skyfall. I just, I think Silver, I think as soon as Silver is on the screen, I think the film picks up. I, I struggle to that point. I find it slow. And I'm not keen on Money Penny. I'm not. I'm not a fan of of the new Money Penny. I prefer wow. Lois Maxwell and uh, Samantha Bond. Uh, sort of a fun Money Penny is is more my style than quite the serious. So right. quite a controversial thing for me to intervene there because I know Skyfall no. is a massive film and it, and loads of people like it, but it's just one that I don't really go to. If I'm going to go to a Daniel Craig, I'll go Casino Royale. Yeah, no, I, I don't disagree with you necessarily. Uh, Casino Royale is a close second. I love that film. And it's not just because it's set in the Bahamas. But um, <laughs> I also think, and I forgot to mention this at the beginning, putting in a director um, like Sam Mendes, I think was a an inspired choice as well. And he's responsible for making those changes with Money, Penny, and Q. Mm. And they were so different when the first time I saw it. I wasn't sure that I liked it either. I, I then had went back to the, to the theater the next day to watch the movie again because of the things that they had changed with what I was used to, the tropes that I was expecting, you know, apart from the fact that, that Money Penny was black and not white, but, you know, also a field agent. Money Penny could never have been a field agent in, in a million years, at least the one I knew. Mm-hmm. And Q was, was the fatherly figure, not the, the kid, you know? But Ben Wishaw did, I thought, did a fabulous job. And I and I don't mind it so much. I, I still think Desmond Llewellyn, no one will ever replace him. Yeah. I mean, yeah. the guy just tremendous. But I thought the, the risks they took uh, that Sam brought to it were interesting and f- for the yeah. most part work. All right. Well, Vicky, I'm kind of sitting here wondering whether to hold my tongue or not. Maybe I should. <laughs> no, don't. <laughs> don't hold your tongue. We want to hear. Be you careful to hold my peace. You go. Okay. I... I He's can't get into the Daniel Craig films at all, in the slightest. Wow. The last Bond film for me was World Is Not Enough. That's kind of where I stand on things. I've, I've tried. There's just nothing that, that I can get into about it. So is it Daniel? Step, is it the plots? Too far, however. Say again? Is it Daniel? Is it the plots? What's It's oh. it's the character. It's the actor, yeah. Okay. I mean, again, going back to growing up, watching the films, you go to it for a character you can aspire to, you can learn from. So it's how to dress, how to act, how to, to, to travel the world and be at home in the world. And to go from that to, I know it's been said before, a Jason Bourne type character. Mm. If I want that, I'll get a Jason Bourne film. Uh. I kind of fed up with the fact that he seems to fall two, 300 feet in every film and just walk away from it. <laughs> I, I can't buy into that. I can't really buy into the... They should call him Jaws then. <laughs> um, I, I, I struggle with the, the, the suits that don't quite fit. There's nothing mm. to aspire to there. Mm-hmm. Um, it might grow me in time, but you know, there we are. <laughs> yeah. I, I tend to agree with David. Actually, I, I like. I mean, I watch them. I, I I'll go to the theater when wow. they come out. Mm-hmm. I do like Casino Royale. I thought Skyfall, and of course, I have to give hats to Adele. I think she did a fantastic job on the Skyfall yeah. soundtrack. Mm-hmm. But I'm David. I'm much like you. I, they're just so action movies, so blow them up. And I know Pierce Brosnan brought some of that to the game through the, the 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 late 90 movies but it's like it's just so like my adrenaline goes so hard in these movies it's just because every every scene is this action-packed scene that like just it's exhausting watching some of these films you know but that's yeah. that's my thought but i think unfortunately that that has a lot to do with our changing tastes you know yes. you can't you can't mm-hmm. do a slow say. 
a boil movie anymore because oh, I agree. Yeah, I mean, split them watch it. Why they're doing what they're doing? It's, it's just not my um, yeah. bag to quote Austin Powers, but I, yeah, it's I, yeah. I see what they're doing with it and why. Yeah, absolutely. yeah, yeah the, the they thing always for me have about a struggle. Casino Royale, it was nice to see that story done right. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. As opposed to what they did in '67. Oh, <laughs> no, kind of nice right. <laughs> but they, right. they they've struggled yeah. with it for a while now. The the balance of it being a spy movie, kind of authentic kind of spy movies like Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, which has none of this kind of stuff is going on with the Craig mm-hmm. movies, and it being a an adventure kind of action adventure adventure movie versus the spy movie. And yeah. it, there's always this. And it's like you said, Lindsay, it's like, this is what people are looking for now. And so they're mm-hmm. going to do it. They're going to say, okay, this is going to sell more tickets. So it's going to have more explosions, more action, more whatever. But I kind of agree. I, some of that needs to be balanced out. And you could go, you can, you can go with some of it, but you can't go with all of it. Every scene it can't be uh, the pinnacle, you know? <laughs> right. So. Well, and, how, and it's interesting as you make that comment, David, in that your first choice of when, that you talked about in terms of your movies mm. is from Russia with Love, which mm. is a movie that doesn't have all that over the yeah. top stuff, right. and is a spy movie that's a in the classic sense of the word, if you will. I think yeah. that's fair. I think even watching some of these films as a kid, my my eyes would start to roll in some of the over the top humor. Mm-hmm. In some cases, not in all cases, and some of the action stuff. It's not necessarily the the main reason I would I would go to a film. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, certainly the, the, the new films, they, they look stunning. The photography, yes. the coloration is superb. It looks like a, you know, expensively made tourist tourist video, which is, is great. <laughs> but I think some of that is covering up not great writing or not as potent writing as, as maybe it could be. Well, things did definitely change with Purvis and Wade. Yeah. 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 I think maybe there's just an intersection of my age and the writer's age. And when the writer's older than me, who knows a little bit more. And, and when I'm older than the writers, and <laughs> I might know more than them in some cases, I don't know. <laughs> All right. So it's, it's kind of funny that you mentioned that because I've always wondered if it's a generational thing as well. Casino Royale is the first one I ever saw cinematically. And, you know, <laughs> I'd seen all the Bond movies leading up to it. And I remember going there that night. And it, it's going to sound kind of funny, but, you know, almost to me, Casino Royale felt like being a kid in the 60s going to go see Goldfinger. It just kind mm-hmm. of blew my mind seeing this. Uh-huh. And part of it might be generation. The other thing might be watching the Bronson movies kind of go from like what they had in Goldeneye to, you know, what they had in Die Another Day. And I was just <laughs> yeah. kind of disheartened by it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I wonder if just like the whole reinvention of the series kind of like blew that back up. And then going to Skyfall, it, it's always like a, a day by day thing. Do I like Casino or do I like Skyfall? And Skyfall had like all these throwbacks to all these other movies. And I know it was on the 50th anniversary, but just all yeah. the callbacks and everything, I, I think that's what really put it together as such a great movie. Yeah. And they, and they play around with you a lot. You know, like he's presumed dead. He goes off and uh, for several months and fools around and comes back when, when he realizes they need him. And he's all scruffy. He looks like death warmed over, you know, the beard and everything. And then uh, they had the scene with, with Money Penny shaving him, which I agree is, you know, I thought for a moment <laughs> they were going to end up in bed. And I thought, you know, and I can't yeah. you know, do right? that. This can't happen. They don't, they don't cross that line. Thank goodness. But yeah. the, the next scene is mm-hmm. him appearing on the bow of the boat, going to the casino in Macau in that midnight blue tuxedo. And I, that when I saw that, I said, this boy has got this down. He just looked the part. It was just terrific. So yeah. did you have, did you ever feel like with the new Money Penny, they were trying to kind of evoke sort of a sense of the classic Mary Goodnight from the novels? Yeah, I think that's possibly true. I don't, I don't know. I think mm-hmm. they, the idea was to twist it up so that we wouldn't know, of course, yeah. as, yeah. as we were aware. They wait till the very end of the film to introduce, to use her name as a way of surprising us all. But, you know, I, I agree. I, I just couldn't see that Money Penny would have done that. I mean, if I was in the game to be a field agent, I can't imagine that I would have settled for yeah. answering the phone for, for M, you know. Yeah. But, uh, you know, anyway, it was, it's an interesting twist. And I think Naomi Harris does a, a fairly good job at playing that character, but it's not the original Money Penny, obviously. 
Right. It's a different. It feels like it's a different character. It's yeah, not Money maybe. Penny. But you, it it, does, we're talking does. about this this whole series. It goes through these cycles. And actually, we interviewed a guy who wrote a little book called "His World Never Dies: The Evolution of James Bond" in the movies. Mm. And it's a good little book. It's only like 110 pages or something like that. David Holcomb is the author, mm. and we did a podcast with him. And he goes through all of the stuff we're talking about now in terms of of the evolution of the movie, how it goes from very serious to more comical to this, to that, and how it keeps flipping back and forth because things change, like you said, Lindsay, what people are looking for and so on. So it's well, a nice it's, It book. wasn't just that. It was also things got too big. And it's like, we've yeah. got to pull this back a little bit. Right. Like <clears throat> Moonraker. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like Moonraker to For Your Eyes Only. That's a, yeah. that's quite a shift. Yeah, yeah. Big, big, big change. And, and that was supposed to be the movie they were going to make instead of uh, Moonraker, but they, they wanted yeah. to cash in on Star Wars and everything else, so yeah. they moved that ahead of <laughs> for, your eyes only. for Your Eyes Only. Right. Yeah. All right, let's move on to License to Kill. Look, this is yeah. Brian's second pick and one of my all-time favorite movies, and I love... <laughs> Robert Davi in this movie. He <laughs> oh, is one yeah. of the most believable villains in any Bond movie. He might be my favorite, actually. Goldfinger is pretty damn good. But License <laughs> to Kill. All right, Brian, it's all yours. <laughs> yeah, so with License to Kill, I, I know for me, like the two movies I chose, it's kind of like I, I picked like some of the actors that people don't really look at, like you know, the really like big stars, like your Sean and your Rogers and stuff like that. But um, take a look back at the Dalton era. In my opinion, he's always been the guy I envisioned when I read the Bond novels. Like, I really mm-hmm. felt like, you know, more so than, you know, anyone else, he really hit the character. Mm-hmm. It's just that, you know, when it translated out into the big screen, people didn't understand it because you're used to the Sean, the Rogers, where it's like a little bit more comedic or they're very, very, these big, huge, you know, personalities on the screen. And I think, you know, Dalton, you know, coming out of the Living Daylights where it was very much like a Roger style film featuring a more serious Dalton style actor. Licensed Kill is really the one that he just hit at home and he just nailed the character. I think it was criminally the last of the Dalton era. I really, really, I mean, I love Pierce and Goldeneye, but if Dalton were in that role, I think that would have been the magic three for Dalton, mm. you know, to match up against Spy Who Loved Me and Goldfinger and, you know, really yeah. put him on the map. I definitely think this was one of the more brutal Bond movies. And um, it's definitely a great detachment from a traditional sense. It's not so much that, you know, Bond's on assignment, he's going out and he's trying to do this. Instead, they incorporate one of the biggest plot points from the Live and Let Die novel and having, you know, Felix fed to the sharks. And I'm a huge Felix Leiter fan. Anytime he shows up in the Bond universe, I'm all about that. You know, the whole, like, chemistry they have between each other even despite the fact that they've almost always changed the actors routinely, except for mm-hmm. you know, Craig's uh, series and, and Licensed Kill, where they bring back David Hennison. You know, I always thought that was just a really, really great way to, you know, go about doing the movie. You know, some other things I like, uh, I like the showcase of Q's talents in this film. I mean, usually when you see Q, he's, mm-hmm. you know, in his laboratory or he's, you know, doing, you know, he's putting together something nice, golden 007, like a fatherly figure. But this is the first time we really see him out in the field, you know, helping him out using the gadgets more like the rake with had the walkie talkie on it. You know, he's, he's really trying to make amends in the room. Cause you know, when Pam's getting upset about, is it Lupa? I think. Yeah. Lupe. Yeah. yeah. Lupe. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing, I think the teaser scene at the very beginning of this film was just masterfully done. You know, the lead up to Felix's wedding, the fact that, you know, Sanchez, you know, is right there for the capturing the way they go about getting to him, the helicopter scenes, the let's go fishing and, you know they come down they connect it and the absolute stunner is when they're like let's go james and they just fall straight down from the heavens and <laughs> land as they go right into the church i thought that was just spectacularly done and i could watch yes. that over and over and that's one of the Absolutely. scenes i really point out is wow like you know this is great writing this is just great cinematography and just really blew my mind let me tell you something on that scene there if yeah. you get down to the keys and you go to the basilica the area that they land in is not very big at all. No. And it oh, makes wow. it that much more spectacular. <laughs> yeah. when, you say, when you actually look at the surroundings and walk, go, how the heck did they do that? Man, yeah, that's, that's really impressive because, um, like you said, on unlike the film, you know, it comes across like this big area, like a big church, and it looks like just laying like street corner. So, you know, looking at that, seeing how small that must have been, you know, yeah. it's really kind of like a, a serious feat to accomplish and, you know, achieve for a film of this size. Other things I like to this, uh, kind of going back to my first film, were the callbacks to Majesty's Secret Service. There's very much, you know, a whole thing of like uh, relationships with like the wedding for Felix and Della. 
Yeah. Even the scene where, you know, Della throws the garter to Bond and he catches it and, you know, he, he kind of has this sentimental smile, but he just kind of walks off and goes about. And, you know, Della's like, did I do something wrong? She's like, he was married once. Yeah. That was a long time ago. And I love that connection, the way yes. it just calls back to that film. And it's kind of goes back to my original point where Majesty's Secret Service just had that thing that just kind of pops up randomly in, in your later installments that just really solidifies a sort of like um, continuity of the series. The only thing I, I felt was, you know, kind of kind of really put it down a little bit was it came out in a summer that had some serious blockbusters. Yeah. I know with uh, Batman of the 89 came out that year. Yeah. <laughs> You had like the Ghostbusters sequel. You had, you know, I, I think Lethal Weapon, one of those movies came out that year. Yeah. And all these La other... Last Crusade. That was out. That oh, Last Crusade. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We're up against yeah. some biggies. The, yeah. the Spielberg James Bond, you know. <laughs> 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 all those other things. I, I do like how they kind of updated it. And it was, there was a very 80s feel to it. Mm -hmm. So when I think of like 80s James Bond film, you kind of look at like a view to a kill, like with Grace Jones and more. And uh, licensed to kill with like Dalton. And the thing is, where if you took Kill was an 80s film, it felt more like a 60s retrospective in my, you know, in terms of me, because I think of like Patrick McNee and having that Avengers connection once again, somewhere how Majesty's had Diana Rigg. And uh, I felt like that was a good closeout to like the 60s version of Bond. Whereas in License to Kill, it was like authentically 80s. And I look at like the bar scene, I look at like the clothing styles they wore. And also just like the hyper realism of it it really felt like an 80s action movie hmm. and you can really point to like the plot you can look to the villains you can look the way that you know things are just going about it just really stood out in that sense and i really felt that even though it was like a piece of its time because the way the story was written and you know just like uh, robert davies acting and you know hmm. timothy dalton's exploring of the character i felt that that really put it all together nicely. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Fantastic uh, yeah. movie. I loved Robert Davi. I mean, and, yeah. Yeah. and Bernicio del Toro as, as yeah. uh, Dario. I mean, that guy was frightening. Yeah. 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 Well, and I even love, you know, if you go out, I mean, Carrie Lowell as, as Pam, I just absolutely mm. yeah. love with her. Very but, strong uh, yeah. um, uh, woman. Very but strong even, woman. Even the Wayne Newton character, right? <laughs> I got your heart. I, I, I was okay was, with Wayne. <laughs> that was so funny, but God he, bless. Partly you. because it was Wayne, but it was. It, I, I loved the character, and then having him do it, it just it just took it over the top for me. Right. So you got to bring a Wayne Newton on that one. Yeah, I'm glad you brought it up. <laughs> yeah, we have a few videos on our YouTube channel on that. Uh, on actually, we went to Felix Leiter's house and oh, where wow. he where she throws the garter. Let you mentioned uh, Brian. Mm -hmm. And we actually rang the bell there, and their address is 707, and it's got it. He's got the gun, the Bond gun coming out of the last seven. Mm -hmm. So they were Bond fans after after the movie. Now the the house sold about six or seven years ago, and now I I don't know who owns it now, but no one answered when we were there. But we we're we we're gonna actually hey, can we go look in the yard. The security camera <laughs> did look at us though. Yes, they had a security <laughs> camera, so we made sure we showed our shirts. It's like hey. <laughs> Standard CIA equipment, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. It was fun though. But the Key West for for the license to kill uh, locations. Oh my God! There's a the, the church, the the Hemingway House, uh, everything. It's just gorgeous. Yeah, you've got to go from where Beautiful. you are, Brian. You have to go the furthest part in the continental yeah. U.S. <laughs> from where you are. Yeah. up in Seattle. Yeah, to you're, get you're... down there. But if you're <laughs> if you really like this movie, you should do it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I and and Key that. West is not so yeah. bad. We went to the airport, too, where Sanchez's plane lands and everything. We oh. interviewed the guy who owns the, uh, the airport there. He does parachuting lessons and stuff. And he told us a little bit about how they had to land the jet and, and what they had to do to do it and what they had to configure the runway to do it because it was not made for jets and it was too short of a runway. It was fun. So hey, it was a lot, of, a lot of great stuff there. So you got to go sometime. And it's Key West. Too. I mean, yeah. That's what I have to do. I have to tell my fiance I found a new way to get married. You know, I'm going to parachute into the church, and you know, we'll, uh... <laughs> exactly. there you go. I think someone got hurt in that. Actually, they they actually got hurt after they parachuted in in that scene. But I can't remember the exact story. But mm. it's really? in the extra credits or whatever. Yeah. Oh, I thought they they did it one take. I thought too. But it, it, we have a video of the church also, and and we do a pan. You could see what what it looks like there in the video it's now it's the trees small. were taller now yeah so. of course yeah but yeah. It's still oh, you'll yeah. see the small area it's a very small area yeah. gorgeous little church though beautiful yeah. 
So, but I agree. I've, recent, I've recently watched this, so this is well fresh in my mind. This film, and I'm very much a Formula Bond fan, so you know, I like the over the top villains, and I thought I wouldn't like License to Kill. And Davey for me is, is one of the best. He's understated, <laughs> ambitious. Um, he questions, makes Bond think about his professionalism and how far he can go. Yeah. Um, so I really rate this film, even though it's completely throwing the rule book out the window for me because I like Formula Bond and all the, you know, the, the, the gadget girls and a big, big villain. So yeah, it's a, it's a great film and it's, um, I prefer it to The Living Daylights. It's the one mm. that I would watch out the two. Yeah, mm-hmm. And I can, I, and I go back to with the villains, it's, you know, Davi's character is another one of these believable villains, mm-hmm. like in Goldfinger, mm-hmm. right? Where it's like, I, ca- I can believe that's a real person. Didn't want to take as over much the world. as I love Silva in Skyfall, I'm not sure that I really buy how believable he is, that, you know, that person really exists, although it probably does. But, um, <laughs> but you know, if, if you look at Robert Davi's character, or you look at Goldfinger's character, absolutely 100%, no questions asked, that's a believable character. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what I loved about that. I, I like almost, that. I, I agree. I think that uh, Davi's scenes with and Dalton, they must have loved, they're both theater trained actors and uh, must have uh, just loved chewing that all up. Um, and they, and they, they do a terrific job with each other. Um, no question about it. And it's very understated license to kill it's not it's not a as you say it's not a formulaic bond and he plays it very much more rough than than uh, others and you know i guess that stands to reason the living daylights was frankly set up to be a, a roger movie yeah. and then right. they moved on so he inherited that yeah but uh license to kill is really the first sort of timothy uh, yeah he, he, he read all the uh, all the fleming novels ahead of yeah, time to, to make sure he got into the character and he he was probably of all of them the the, the closest to Fleming character yeah, of Bond. Definitely. Well, I, and, I, and, and I've, I've, I also agree. It's a shame that he didn't get to do a third one because yes, uh, I wish was, he would have legal issues. Criminal yeah. issue. Yeah. 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 And I had actually read that the, the comment that Daniel's Bond wouldn't work if you hadn't had Timothy set it up. Mm. Right. Because you had the very too. serious Bond. Yeah. Then you had Pierce, which wasn't. And then you've got Daniel coming back around being a more serious yeah. Bond. Yeah. And I think partly due to the success of when you look back at what Timothy did in this. I think that's probably true. He um, introduced it. It's it's kind of like George Lazenby being the first unfortunate soul to follow Sean. So by the time we got to, to Roger, we, we knew that someone else could be James Bond. You know? Right. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. true. Yeah. 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 The other thing I thought that really stood out too, and I, I think this is really speaks to Robert Davi's, you know, interpretation of the Sanchez character. He's very human, and you almost, yes, you yes. almost like him in a way. Yeah. And it, yes. the thing that I really point out to me is, it's like you know when he's talking to Felix, and he's like, "I just want you to know, my friend, this is purely business, yeah. strictly yeah. business." Or, yeah. And right. then later on, you know, when they have um, Crest, who's in the thing, and he's like, "Are you really going to pay this guy?" And he's like stick to my word you know i'm you know i'm i've always Loyal. been about loyalty and this and that and you just get that sense of wow here's a man of principle and passion like yeah he's involved in criminal activities and he's done some horrendous things but yeah he's also yeah. got a very sense of hey you help me i'll help you he's like yeah. I'm, I'm all about loyalty and it's like you know i'm not above taking care of someone who's done a, a, a favor to me yeah as opposed to, uh you see some of these other movies will just wipe out like let's just wipe out these people i don't need them anymore like goldfinger where he wipes out all the gangsters in the yeah. room like you know he really takes care of them i think um just the whole psyche and just uh different things like that i think that's what made it work so well because then when you bring in dalton's character and you can see as he systematically just kind of like starts messing with sanchez's mind he's like yeah. there was only one or wait a minute, yeah yeah, yeah. i love that and at the very end the best part was that line at the very end it's like don't you want to know why? And Sanchez is kind of like... He hesitates for that split second that costs him everything. <laughs> yeah. So good. I think the uh, the tanker chase at the end is still mm-hmm. absolutely wow. Uh, when I watched it recently, it's an amazing uh, scene, sequence of, of events <laughs> to have a tanker on two wheels. <laughs> I mean, it's an amazing stunt. Really brilliant. I thought it was also impressive how they have the bullets that sound out the Bond theme as he's jumping from tanker to tanker. <laughs> I thought that was really cool. A nice little tidbit and a bit of trivia. That's cool. Very I had cool. to listen to that one. Yeah. I got oh, yeah. to go back and listen. I don't know. Yeah. I don't think I've ever <laughs> realized that. I never noticed that before. Oh, wow. 
Cool. Yeah. For me, the, the most the most Bond element of that one is the the water skiing behind the plane. Yeah. Yeah. And the music yeah. kicks in, mm-hmm. and the whole cinema just almost stands up. Yeah. 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 <laughs> That, that's a great one. And then he Very takes over the plane and all the bills are flying all over the place. I actually have one of those bills. I collect weird <laughs> stuff. So I have one of the bills that were flying all over the place. I hope it's the one that was in his face, but it's probably not. <laughs> <laughs> it's also a scene where you get like a rare laugh from Dalton. Like as he's flying in the plane away, it's like he starts laughing, he throws the money and it's like, yeah, it, it's just interesting. You really don't get a lot of like, I mean, it's very dry humor. But uh, you know, like a really sense of a joy in Dalton. But he's like, yes, you know, I escaped this, I pulled this off, and he's just like, you know, you know, he just feels really good in the moment. And I think it was just perfect. Yeah, yeah I always think like the structure of it is very like the the man, the golden gun novel, mm-hmm. where yeah. you know he infiltrates the villain and disrupts everything from the inside, and it's that that sort of structure, that kind of Mark Hazard, you know, character that he, he takes on from time to time. Um, yeah, yeah, spy stuff. <laughs> spy stuff. Yeah. <laughs> No, I definitely agree there, because if you look at, like, Scaramanga from the original Man with a Golden Gun novel, you know, he's kind of like this gangster kind of guy. And, um, you know, even looking at how, like, um, you know, Sanchez is, it's it's the same thing on a more international level. Mm-hmm. Um, you're going into South America and stuff like that. And I think it's just, you know, the difference between, you know, a 1965 novel and, like, an 89 film, just the change in times and things like that. It's just, like, a more modern interpretation of it. Yeah, I mean, the, the novel's not great. It's a bit of a a challenge in parts to get to get through it um so yeah. i think just lifting the whole thing and updating it yeah yeah no, absolutely agree. that that whole concept of infiltrating there was there's a uh 2018 indian movie and i, I may mispronounce it it's r-a-a-z-i razi i think is how you say it it's it's english subtitles and it's a you talk about infiltrating this indian lady marries a pakistan somebody in a pakistani higher up military family and you know you're really you're really in the middle of it at that point so you, you look at some of these where they you take that concept and can roll with it and it's done very well yeah. so it's probably mm-hmm. one i would assume none of you have seen it but uh if you want a, a good one that's in subtitles razi mm-hmm. uh, highly recommend that one too well, check that all one. right look for that all right i think we're gonna wrap this up <laughs> this has been fun yeah uh, absolutely yeah so again, yeah. anyone listening out there, you want to join our group, it's on Facebook. Go to facebook.com slash Navigator and join our group. These guys all are in our group, and we're going to do more of these in the future. So join us for sure. Today, we'd like to thank Scott Winteroth, David Lippiet, Lindsay Cansino, and Brian Herr for great contributions. This has been a fun discussion. Fun thank discussion. You, we this love really it. was fun. Great stuff. All right. Thanks again. Hey, this has been Dan Silvestri. I'm Pizzotto. I'm Vicky Hodges. The SpyMovieNavigator.com. Thanks for joining us today. We'll be back with more fun stuff. Thanks.